So good morning to all the participants from Manav Rachna and who have joined us from India and uh, uh, good evening to Professor Petra who has joined us from New Zealand and good morning to Mr. Shritij who has been instrumental in organizing this very interesting uh, uh, virtual session today on international arbitration in the Commonwealth, a gamble or a chance. We have uh, one of the most uh, expert and eminent uh, speaker for today's session, Professor Petra Butler, who is the Professor of Law in the Victoria University of Wellington. Uh, she specializes in domestic and international human rights, public and private uh, comparative law, and international commercial law, with an emphasis on international commercial contracts and dispute resolution. Professor Petra is a visiting faculty for numerous universities all across uh, five continents. She regularly speaks in various international forums and conferences and has contributed immensely uh, by publishing various journals and books. Uh, she is a fully qualified German and New Zealand lawyer and admitted as a barrister to the High Court of New Zealand. Uh, we welcome you, Professor Petra, and thank you for taking your time out to be with us today. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for this really kind introduction. And um, yeah, welcome to all of you. And I'm really honored that you take out your time to listen, listen to me and to talk about, with you about one of my really kind of pet projects. Um, international arbitration, the Commonwealth's a gamble or a chance. And this is all about what I really, what I want to talk about is the 2019 Commonwealth Secretariat International Commercial Arbitration Study. That study got a, is a little bit of a COVID victim because when it got published, it was unfortunately published last year where we couldn't quite give it the attention that, it, that I think it kind of deserves. I hope um, you're, you will have lots of questions. So my idea is to talk for about maybe ha as a half an hour, uh, 40 minutes, and then please feel free to ask me as all the questions that come up. Now, I don't think I tell you anything particularly new, but I just want to emphasize that India is, of course, one of the largest economies in Asia. And the number of international arbitrations involving Indian parties and or contractual performance in India is unsurprisingly large. So India related disputes are today a common and recurring feature of the caseload of multiple leading arbitral institutions, for example, SIAC, which is the closest one, ICC and the um, LCIA and arbitrating under those rules. The government of India has been um, very progressive and progressively kind of encouraging um, uh, arbitration also, also to um, diminish a little bit the workload of the court. So arbitration in India is not only important, but we will what my personal experience is also measuring it on the participation of Indian teams at the this mood, a really life issue and a lot of interest. Um, it has the arbitration landscape has put, has quite changed in the last uh, uh, years. There was, especially in the past five years, there was a substantial overhaul of the Act in 2015, but there was also an amendment in 2019, and there was just a recent amendment. So overall, India is really in the flow of developing its, its arbitration. But India is also a Commonwealth country. And... Um, and that has, and this is what I want to talk with you about, maybe some real chances. Because the Commonwealth is something very unique in the world. Even though it is not unlike the EU, for example, like a supranational organization where somebody can make regulations and everybody else needs to follow, the Commonwealth is still a, a, a 
more like a, I wouldn't say a coffee club, but it is like a voluntary organization where you have model laws and you have ideas that you share, but and you can you can achieve things by doing it this doing having this using the same model law, but without any enforcement power. But it has historically, it has the same history to, for for long long period of time, and all common law commonwealth countries are based on have a law regime which is based on common law, and the language of trade in common law commonwealth countries is English. So that is, for example, a huge advantage in comparison to the EU. So, so with that in mind, the question really is, can the Commonwealth achieve something together in regard to arbitration to make it this fantastically arbitra fantastic arbitration zone, yeah, which makes inter especially international arbitration really easy? And with that, get actually a heads up to other um, areas in the world. So um, what I want to do, I want to quickly tell you what the aim was, then have a very brief tell you what the methodology was and the sources, and then go into some of the findings, what the report actually found and some recommendations. So the aim of the study was really to understand the issues that might prevent the effective use of international commercial arbitration across the Commonwealth. And then once you understood this to come up with some recommendation based on what I already said, the acknowledgement how important uh, international commercial arbitration is for trade. And to really emphasize that, to have a really good international dispute resolution framework in any country. And international arbitration is part of it. It is not the silver bullet, and it is definitely not the only international dispute resolution me method or regime, but it is a really important one. And therefore you need to have an international arbitration framework, which is best practice in modern. So it is important for two reasons to have an interna good international dispute resolution framework. Firstly, and this is what everybody, every the reason everybody always says is to attract foreign investment, if you so wish. But the second reason is one which is often overlooked. If you don't have a good dispute resolution mechanism uh, framework that also allows small and medium sized enterprises, i.e. SMEs, to trade cross border, then you're depriving your own economy of growth because economists are relatively uniform in the view that the best way to grow an economy is through SMEs, and SMEs have the ad additional advantage that they distribute uh, wealth far more equally, um, so they help with poverty reduction, and for women, it is generally a good employment. So it is not only the attracting foreign investment part, which is really important, it is also the way to encourage and allow your own businesses to trade cross-border. So what we did is we did a mixed black letter law and law in context comparative law analysis. So we did use um, desktop research, but we also did um, empirical research. So we did 65 interviews with arbitration specialists from all corners of the Commonwealth, and we did did eight surveys. We did an arbitrator survey, council, arbitral institutions, a judiciary service, we, we surveyed the governments, we surveyed academics, 
we served students. And the reason we served students was we actually got an email from an Indian student who said, oh, if you're doing this, I've just heard about it. I think, you know, we, it would be really important to ask students as well. And so we did. And we, uh, we also uh, served the business community. And especially regarding the business community, we had done some interviews first before we conceptualized that survey. And that actually made a huge difference. We also then had meetings with organizations like the uh, LCIA and the ICCA, ICC, but also with the LMAA, which is the London Maritime Arbitration Association, GAFTA, so that are all the commodity traders, GAFTA, Phosphor, International Cotton, London Metal Exchange, coffee, and refined sugar. So we went outside the normal framework of your international arbitration discourse, which is often very, very a discourse among providers, other RE arbitrators, counsel, and consumers that are very high-end businesses and is very business oriented. Commodity arbitration um, works a little bit differently. Um, and so those both community often don't talk to each other. And we made a real concerted effort to actually get their views as well. So coming now to the quantitative, just a few findings of the arbitrator survey, because it is quite interesting. So we get 162 answers. 17 from non-lawyers, um, that include even architect, commodity traders, engineers. 76% of all um, uh, arbitrators who answered were a member of the Chartered Institute, and 40% were a member of the arbitral institution. Now, if you look at the general statistics, we had most of them were convert citizens. We even had people, we had even arbitrators from the Caribbean uh, and Asia, not, not a lot, Canada and Malta and Cyprus. Not very unsurprisingly, but that comes something very surprising. 80% of our respondents were male and a third of them were 65 to 74 years old. And half of them work as arbitrators in council. Now, um, what was, so you see, if you look at the appointment statistics, we had also there um, quite a range and what you kind of would expect giving also the age structure, you, the appointment structure matches that. If we look at the, uh, we asked a question around what arbitral procedure, what arbitral rules you were using, we had 60 different rules. So that there is definitely diversity in rules. Um, but when it came to the preferred seats, then it became also relatively predictable. The UK was 70%, Singapore 36, Paris 24, Hong Kong 18%. But now look at the bullet point before. Why do arbitrators prefer a certain state? And that actually is not very diverse. That's actually quite homely, yeah? So one of your preferred seat is because that's your home. Another preferred seat is of course it's popular with the parties. It's an easy place to get to. Now this is, this is all pre-COVID, but we did actually ask some uh, IE as a, uh, online questions. Important the diversity of the arbitrator talent pool, and that were the reasons for Singapore and New York. Now, the arbitrators identified the, as most important issues facing international arbitration in the individual country capacity building and edu education, costs, diversity of arbitrators, widening the pool, but it's only three, and a clearer role of the national courts. If you look at the three most important issues in the Commonwealth, it was capacity building and education and awareness, law reform, costs, 
And only at number three was the diversity in arbitrator appointment. This is important because if you think about it, we have a third of our arbitrators between 65 and 74. So I, when I when we got the results, kind of said, ah, oh, they all have done the diversity course. You know, they all need, we need more women. Yeah. So they have all done the course. They are all political correct. The interesting thing is what they really meant. And that then came through actually in the, um, and I come to that in the council survey. But I can say it now already. What they mean with diversity is not necessarily gender diversity or nation. What, what they mean is, is the diversity in the knowledge of the arbitrator. And in the council survey and, in some, and even in the arbitrator survey, what was really interesting for us was that there is a groundswell of kind of dissatisfaction with international arbitration in regard to the quality of the arbitrator. And that is linked to diversity. Because if you as counsel or as a party have, don't know a lot about international arbitration and you need to pick an arbitrator, then the business side of arbitration, meaning the how you advertise and the information you get about the arbitrator becomes incredibly important. So you might choose a fantastic arbitrator, unfortunately the wrong one for the subject matter at hand. And it might be, and this is what where the diversity comes in, that there are not enough arbitrators having a particular knowledge about a particular system. The other question we ask um, in all surveys was one um, whether or not it would be useful, um, whether or not the Commonwealth arbitral institutions would, would work to work together or would, uh, closer, had closer um, cooperation. And there was a resounding yes. And overall, because we asked that question, so there is actually quite a lot of cooperation um, going on already. So the question is also around, should there be a Commonwealth Association of Arbitral Institutions? And the other question we asked is whether or not there would be value in a new Commonwealth-wide dispute resolution regime for business-to-business -business cross border commercial disputes. And that is would be particularly aimed at SMEs. It would not be international arbitration as such. It would be a Commonwealth country to country, so international um, convention, looking at a, providing a particular dispute resolution system for B2B uh, based on international arbitration. And then even there, we had overall, it's tight, but over half, so about 52% in every survey said yes, that would be good, realizing that particularly for SME at the moment, the, the international dispute resolution framework is not fit for purpose. So the role of the Commonwealth, the arbitrators thought was capacity building, education and awareness raising and marketing. So very much in the soft law realm where the Commonwealth can act. If you now have a look at council and if you look at the general statistics, so you get far wider spread, far more diverse and also a different age also very predictable, so less male, more females, but overall younger and 55% have 10 years PQA. So that's, um, that's overall um, quite, uh, was qu quite interesting and, and, and was quite, quite good in affirming what if you would have asked us beforehand, we would have predicted in regard to the general statistics. And they came from all sorts of backgrounds with an emphasis actually on commercial law, unsurprisingly. So, but, but we were also very interesting in their client base. And so most of them had a 60% mixture of domestic and foreign law. And 
The involvement of in, in International Dispute Resolution in 2018 was, you know, probably not as high as we would have thought. That brings me to another point, um, at least in some parts of Europe, or if I go to the Vismut, uh, which is a, is a dedicated mooting competition for international commercial arbitration and international um, contract law, CISG, it is a fantastic weight area of law. However, even the involvement, this statistic here shows you that it is very rare, and there are only very few probably law firms, that you will find, as a relatively speaking, that only do international arbitration. So in other words, you can't build your, your career on international arbitration at all alone. You will need to have other areas of law you want to cover. And since international arbitration is procedural, you know, it is sometimes far more important to have a good knowledge of the substantive law and then add your knowledge into international arbitration. Um, what council did so what we did find is that arbitration and other, another council we surveyed was the preferred method of B2B dispute resolution. However, if you look at negotiation and mediation and take this together, then that is definitely a close run up. Um, and some of them made this, made this topic, typical um, reply as it depends on the case. And I think I would agree with this, this is why I'm always talking about you need a smorgasbord of uh, dispute resolution mechanisms and then pick the one which is best for your case. So the value of the claim and the applicable law are also determinative factors. And um, the other interesting thing is that only, and my mind have to say only, 58 of clients have a single written contract document. And I will come back to that when we talk, look at the business side of it. Um, I think you probably also have learned in law school, at least that's the way we teach and the way I have been taught is always, you know, everything is so nice. People have contracts and it's also generally adversarial because there's always the right outcome. But actually, if you especially talk to SMEs, you will discover life is not definitely everything but perfect, and especially SMAs the world over, do not have one single document. Some have maybe an order form, have part of a contract, have a couple of v, um, WhatsApp chats or Signal or whatever you know method, you, communication method you are using. Uh, some will have a couple of emails and there might be the odd Skype or Zoom conversation in the middle of it, which actually makes out the rights, obligation and rights under contract. Um, of the, what, what was quite pleasing though is of the uh, written contracts there, 60% of those written, written contracts do have a choice of law clause and 70% even have an institutional arbitration clause. In other words, if you get your client or you can advise your client and your client has a lawyer, or if you have a relatively sophisticated a business, once they have a written document, they're actually not that bad in put, putting at least a dispute resolution clause into their contract. So that's actually quite, there's hope. So the, the three worst characteristics of international arbitration for a council were procedural issues, dissatisfaction with the arbitrator, and that was quite surprising, and costs. And then the three most important issues facing international arbitration in the individual country are procedure, again, capacity building and awareness, and you can see a theme a, a, a coming up here, and arbitral institutions. So the three most important issues facing the Commonwealth were also procedure, inc inclusive, inc inc inclusive of cost, capacity building, and arbitrary institutions. So council saw the role 
um, of the Commonwealth and capacity building and knowledge sharing and education, but also in the drafting of common rules in helping developing countries. Uh, and that featured relatively, as a very strongly um, in, in, in the council surveys. Okay, I will not bore you with more, but I do want to talk about the business one. So one, one of the biggest issues with businesses um, is that, especially when it comes to SMA, small and medium-sized businesses, many of them, are actually too busy to, to, to answer service is one thing. The other thing is, if you're not a lawyer and you have a survey that doesn't speak their language, but uses legal language, you're not getting correct results. And my biggest gripe has been that I've seen a lot of surveys where I actually think that they ask the wrong questions or they ask the questions in a way that the, the probably, especially the business, you know, take the first answer, uh, first answer and the first question, the second answer and the second question, the third answer and the third question, because they actually didn't know what they were talking about. Now, I've, I've um, interviewed a good number of uh, SMEs and as a project, we have uh, interviewed SMEs also in uh, Spain and Austria and in Singapore. And um, quite frankly, I had one SME telling me, well, you know, arbitration was this tree, tree hugging love fest, which clearly indicates that this SME owner had no idea what arbitration is and basically muddled it up with mediation. And I think even commercial mediation would not be a tree hugging love fest. Anyway, so we tried to ameliorate that issue and used actually the um, uh, the interviews we had that I had done before and, and, and my friend and my partners had done before as a basis for the um, survey to get actually a little bit more of a of, of a testing ground what that actually was about and what they really wanted now and just to make it make it um, really short is have a look at that 38 percent of the businesses in our service never use a lawyer when they have an issue. 52% don't use any less letter of credits, which is just funny for me because this is what we normally promulgate through the smooth. But overall, the majority of SMEs do not have one written contract document. So we need to think very creatively what, this, what a dispute resolution mechanism needs to look like for them. And the majority of SMEs work on trust. So, that, so in New Zealand, for example, we could not find any SME that basically by itself would sue if, if something was wrong in a contract, his contracting partner or her, her, its contracting partner. Even large businesses in New Zealand, this might be also a little bit of a cultural thing, they avoid going to any sort of dispute resolution mechanism, dispute resolution. So if we then think about the cost issue in arbitration and maybe the issue about, you know, not having good arbitrators, which are all linked together, we need to also think about SMEs and how are we making this actually work for SMEs as part of the variety of dispute resolution mechanisms. So in addition to our surveys, and I don't want to bore you with them anymore, we did 54 um, country reports. So we did a country report for every, every member state, member country, where we looked, for example, at legal aid, at the um, rule of maintenance and charity, but also generally on statistics on their major cases. So it's actually quite a good resource if you want to get a really snapshot of different countries and how they deal with, with arbitration. So looking at what our report now, we identified seven challenging challenges, you know, searching for the truth. It is, first of all, the lack of a robust international commercial arbitration framework. So we, we at that point in 2019, we had still had the majority of member countries that did not have an up modern arbitration framework. We still have a few um, 
countries in the Commonwealth that not even have ratified the uh, New York Convention. The numbers got up after that report came out and there was this meeting in Colombo in November 2019. We saw a few ratific more ratifications of the UN, uh, UN Convention and we saw some modernization efforts, but that is the, your first and the more basic step. We have a lack of familiarity and understanding among lawyers, uh, but also businesses. So, um, and one thing I also want to mention is that, which came out in the, the academic survey, international arbitration has not been taught in, in most countries or all countries we surveyed for not even one generation, which equals about 25 years. Um, which means, that if you're a lawyer, generally speaking, if you're a lawyer now in a management position, you went to law school without even having a chance to know about international arbitration. So the only reason you would know about it is because for, for you had a case where you needed to upskill or you had a friend who say, said to you, Let, let's upskill somewhere, you know, do a chartered institute uh, course, but it was not, it's not been part of the fabric of teaching. And, uh, and so, and that makes, that makes a difference. So as I talked before, we definitely have an issue with arbitrary quality and diversity. We have rising costs. We have the use of technology, which of course now this has been overhauled a little bit in the last uh, two years, whatever, 18 months. And we definitely have regulatory challenges. And this is around allowing arbitrators to come into a country issuing with a visa. There are certain tax issues which make life relative, sometimes really difficult for arbitrators. But we, we you know, constructively, we developed nine solutions. First of all, as I said, and unsurprisingly, every country needs a more than best practice international arbitration uh, framework that enhances cost efficiency. We need to aware, we make <laughs> we do awareness raising and capacity building. And that not only includes, um, and that might have been a little bit of a surprise for some sectors of the arbitration community. This is not about having more arbitration conferences. What this means, for example, is that at your normal contract law conference, yeah, so the, the Commonwealth Contract Law Conference, the Indian, Indian Contract Law Conference, have a panel on dispute resolution. Because whom you need to educate, as I indicated, are the people who don't know. And most of those people not even know what they don't, what they don't know. And the same is true for businesses. You don't run first up um, at the beginning in a conference for businesses on international arbitration, international mediation and litigation. You go to your industry, construction industry conference, and then have asked them to have one panel on legal solutions. So you need to get in there where you have people, what I say, work, not even know what they don't know. We talked about cost effectiveness, and there we actually is particularly referred to Section 29A of the Indian Arbitration Act of 1996 as enacted in 2019. And that is the rule about the 12 months having, having an award within 12 months. We really recommended regulatory changes, changes like you know, enhancing existing tax and visa restrictions and informing stakeholders about the impact of the European uh, General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, which seems to cause some issues. And that probably will hopefully be, become really apparent around um, the online COVID um, and how, you know, the more uh, hearings online, we Zoom hearings or WebEx hearings we had in the last 18 months. Very important is also a digitization strategy. It's now the Commonwealth has a digitization strategy. Because it is all fantastic to say we're all going online and we're doing a lot of um, artificial, using artificial intelligence and we're doing discovery online, all fantastic. But it does require that people are, first of all, literate when it comes to online. 
And secondly, it also requires, if, if we all might have found out by now, that everybody has a stable internet. And that might not be true, this issue might not be true for India, but I can tell you there are lots of countries where getting a stable internet connection is a real issue. And if you get one, it might be incredibly expensive. So, and then one of the, one of the you know, things I'm really keen on um, is the development of a cross-border dispute resolution scheme for business-to-business -business disputes, as I, as I alluded to earlier, based on international commercial arbitration. And maybe in the question and answer, we can explore this a little bit more, because the idea is, if you look at litigation, this is far too complicated for an SME. International arbitration may be mixed with, not mixed, but together with international mediation in a bespoke kind of convention that makes it a default mechanism. It makes litigation the opt-in uh, dispute resolution mechanism might be far better and suit uh, SMEs as a particularly much better. And then we also suggested a Commonwealth Association uh, of arbitral institutions and organizations. So as in the new developments to watch as a discussion on diversity and even in the last year, there's lots happening in that space. Um, there are also developments in regard to uh, the arbitral process. So we had the park rules, which might work better in certain situations. We need transparency in arbitrary selection, um, and there are organizations like Arbitrator Intelligence, for example, that try to do that. And of course, we're looking at online uh, dispute resolution and artificial intelligence. Now, is it a gamble or a chance, Commonwealth uh, arbitration in the common in the Commonwealth? I actually do think the Commonwealth now having looked at all those aspects and actually have like a starting point with this report, I actually do think that if Commonwealth countries do work together, obviously there always be, will be some com competition among arbitral centers, arbitral institutions. However, for example, having a unified regulatory environment around visas and ticks, for example, or having some transparency rules or better practice in arbitrator selection, that I think would be something which would be really helping to make the Commonwealth as an, as an entity, not only in intra-Commonwealth dispute resolution, but also with other uh, um, parties from other countries outside the Commonwealth, really attractive. And uh, yeah, and with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Looking forward to your questions and I'm happy to share that deck of slides, the PowerPoint presentation, uh, so that you can have a link to the Commonwealth study.